So today we will read part two of Once Upon a Time by Nadine Gordimer. The riots were suppressed, but there were many burglaries in the suburb, and somebody's trusted housemaid was tied up and shut in a cupboard by thieves while she was in charge of her employer's house. The trusted housemaid of the man and wife and little boy was so upset by this misfortune befalling a friend left, as she herself often was, with responsibility for the possessions of the man and his wife and the little boy, that she implored her employers to have burglar bars attached to the doors and windows of the house and an alarm system installed. The wife said, she is right, let us take heed of her advice. So from every window and door in the house where they were living happily ever after, they now saw the trees and sky through bars. And when the little boy's pet cat tried to climb in by the fanlight to keep him company in his little bed at night, as it customarily had done, it set off the alarm keening through the house. The alarm was often answered, it seemed, by other burglar alarms in other houses that had been triggered by pet cats or nibbling mice. The alarms called to one another across the gardens in shrills and bleats and wails that everyone soon became accustomed to, so that the din roused the inhabitants of the suburb no more than the croak of frogs and musical grating of cicadas' legs. Under cover of the electronic harpies' discourse, intruders sought the iron bars and broke into homes, taking away hi-fi equipment, television sets, cassette players, cameras and radios, jewellery and clothing, and sometimes were hungry enough to devour everything in the refrigerator or paused audaciously to drink the whiskey in the cabinets or patio bars. Insurance companies paid no compensation for single malt, a loss made keener by the property owner's knowledge that the thieves wouldn't even have been able to appreciate what it was they were drinking. So here, the phrases and words such as alarm system installed, saw the trees and sky through bars, other burglar alarms, burglar bars, all of these are symbols of the fear that imprisons this family and the people around. The alarms called to one another across the gardens is an example of personification. And finally, this last paragraph on this page um, is an example of irony because the alarms were supposed to warn the people of intruders, but because they went off so often and there were so many of them, people stopped paying attention to them. They ignored them and took them for granted. And the burglars or the intruders took advantage of the fact that people weren't paying attention to the alarms and they used that noise to get into the houses and rob whatever they wanted. Then the time came when many of the people who were not trusted housemaids and gardeners hung about the suburb because they were unemployed. Some importuned for a job, weeding or painting a roof, anything, boss, madam. But the man and his wife remembered the warning about taking on anyone off the street. Some drank liquor and fouled the street with discarded bottles. Some begged waiting for the man or his wife to drive the car out of the electronically operated gates. They sat about with their feet in the gutters, under the jacaranda trees that made a green tunnel of the street. For it was a beautiful suburb, spoiled only by their presence. And sometimes they fell asleep lying right before the gates in the midday sun. The wife could never see anyone go hungry. She sent the trusted housemaid out with bread and tea. But the trusted housemaid said these were loafers and sotsies who would come and tie her up and shut her in a cupboard. The husband said, she is right. Take heed of her advice. You only encourage them with your bread and tea. They are looking for their chance. And he brought the little boy's tricycle from the garden into the house every night. Because if the house was surely secure, once locked and with the alarm set, someone might still be able to climb over the wall or the electronically closed gates into the garden. You are right, said the wife, then the wall should be higher. 
and the wise old witch, the husband's mother, paid for the extra bricks as her Christmas present to her son and his wife. The little boy got a spaceman outfit and a book of fairy tales. So over here, we see that the wife, she has a kind heart. She wants to help people. Despite her fear, she still wants to give them bread and tea. But her fear controls her and she listens to her husband and the housemaid instead. But every week, there were more reports of intrusion in broad daylight and the dead of night, in the early hours of the morning, and even in the lovely summer twilight. A certain family was at dinner while the bedrooms were being ransacked upstairs. The man and his wife, talking of the latest armed robbery in the suburb, were distracted by the sight of the little boy's pet cat effortlessly arriving over the seven-foot wall, descending first with a rapid bracing of extended forepaws down on the sheer vertical surface and then a graceful launch, landing with a swishing tail within the property. The whitewashed walls was marked with the cat's comings and goings, and on the street side of the wall there were larger red earth smudges that could have been made by the kind of broken running shoes seen on the feet of unemployed loiterers that had no innocent destination. So the intrusions grew, they became more and more, they took place at different parts of the day. When the man and wife and little boy took the pet dog for its walk around the neighborhood streets, they no longer paused to admire the show of roses or that perfect lawn. These were hidden behind an array of different varieties of security fences, walls and devices. The man, wife, little boy and dog passed a remarkable choice. There was the low cost option of pieces of broken glass embedded in cement along the tops of walls. There were iron grills ending in lance points. There were attempts at reconciling the aesthetics of prison architecture with the Spanish villa style, spikes painted pink. And with the plastic urns of neoclassical facades, 12 inch pikes finned like zigzags of lightning and painted pure white. Some walls had a small board affixed, giving the name and telephone number of the firm responsible for the installation of the devices. While the little boy and the pet dog raced ahead, the husband and wife found themselves comparing the possible effectiveness of each style against its appearance. And after several weeks, when they paused before this barricade or that, without needing to speak, both came out with the conclusion that only one was worth considering. It was the ugliest but the most honest in its suggestion of the pure concentration camp style. No frills, all evident efficacy. Placed the length of walls, it consisted of a continuous coil of stiff and shining metal serrated into jagged blades so that there would be no way of climbing over it and no way through its tunnel without getting entangled in its fangs. There would be no way out, only a struggle getting bloodier and bloodier, a deeper and sharper hooking and tearing of flesh. The wife shuddered to look at it. You're right, said the husband. Anyone would think twice. And they took heed of the advice on a small board fixed to the wall. Consult Dragon's Teeth, the people for total security. So here, the couple want to put in more security and they try to get ideas from other houses. So when they go for walks, they no longer admire the roses and the lawns. They only compare the fences and the security systems of different houses. The only one who enjoys the walk is the dog and the boy. Um, this line, which talks about getting entangled in the fence's fangs, is an example of personification. And then you have Dragon's Teeth, the name of the company that does this fencing. And Dragon's Teeth is an illusion that means it's a reference to something famous. So in this case, dragon's teeth refers to Greek mythology. Next day, a gang of workmen came and stretched the razor bladed coils all around the walls of the house where the husband and wife and little boy and pet dog and cat were living happily ever after. 
the sunlight flashed and slashed off the serrations. The cornice of razor thorns encircled the home shining. The husband said, never mind, it will weather. The wife said, you're wrong. They guarantee it's rust proof. And she waited until the little boy had run off to play before she said, I hope the cat will take heed. The husband said, don't worry, my dear. Cats always look before they leap. And it was true that from that day on, the cat slept in the little boy's bed and kept to the garden, never risking a try at breaching security. One evening, the mother read the little boy to sleep with a fairy story from the book the wise old witch had given him at Christmas. Next day, he pretended to be the prince who braves the terrible thicket of thorns to enter the palace and kiss the sleeping beauty back to life. He dragged a ladder to the wall. The shining coiled tunnel was just wide enough for his little body to creep in. And with the first fixing of its razor teeth in his knees and hands and head, he screamed and struggled deeper into its tangle. The trusted housemaid and the itinerant gardener, whose day it was, came running, the first to see and to scream with him, and the itinerant gardener tore his hands trying to get at the little boy. Then the man and his wife burst wildly into the garden, and for some reason, the cat probably, the alarm set up wailing against the screams while the bleeding mass of the little boy was hacked out of the security coil with saws, wire cutters, choppers, and they carried it. The man, the wife, the hysterical trusted housemaid and the weeping gardener into the house. Now the lines, the sunlight flashed and slashed of the serrations that describe how bright and new the new barbed wire fence was is an example of imagery. It creates a picture in your mind. Then you have Sleeping Beauty, which is an illusion. It's a reference to the fairy tale. Then you have these phrases happily ever after palace and prince again these are fairy tale elements and the last paragraph finally is an example of irony again a fairy tale is supposed to end happily however this fairy tale this story ends in a terribly tragic manner the little boy dies in the fence or at least readers would think he did and even if he did not die, he was severely injured for sure. And the very fence that was supposed to protect the family instead took away the most precious thing to them. Now, one of the themes of the story is fear that controls your life is useless. If you're paranoid about things and you are scared of everything, you will never enjoy life and it is not fruitful. Tone, which is the author's attitude towards a subject. In this story, it was light at times, mostly sarcastic and serious too. Mood is the feeling that is created when the readers read the story. And in this story, at the beginning, it was fearful and scary. But through most of the story, there was a feeling of foreboding that something bad was going to come. And finally, at the end, the mood was one of sadness.